you know, if you live somewhere like San Francisco, uh, if you live in uh, New York, if you live in Southern California, Los Angeles, but even if you live in Austin, Texas, last time I was in Austin, Texas, uh, under the, all the highway overpasses, there were 10 cities of homeless people. Uh, this people, this this problem is is uh, very visible. Uh, you know, uh, I remember when I lived in the in the Bay Area. This is in the '90s. Uh, homelessness in San Francisco was awful back then. Uh, they would harass you. They were very aggressive homeless, um, and it was just unpleasant. It was unpleasant to to go to San Francisco. Uh, particularly, my wife used to go alone, and and it was particularly unpleasant for her. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I thought it was bad back in the 70s, and it's like 10 times worse today. I was in San Francisco a few years ago in the Tenderloin District, which is, you know, just two blocks away from Union Square. And, God, you, you couldn't walk in the street. It, it, there were hundreds of them, uh, hundreds of homeless people just camped out in the street. So homeless, uh, the homeless issue is... Um, We'll get to how big it is in a minute, but it, but it's obviously uh, uh, very very big in a few key cities. It's it's interesting that uh, you could go through a number of different states, and we'll talk about why this is. But a number of different states in the union have very little homeless problems. Uh, the homeless problem is concentrated in California, in New York, in Texas, in Florida, uh, and. Uh, and, and, and in, in those places, the homeless problem is almost always uh, concentrated in big cities. Uh, in, in, and it, it tends to be concentrated in vibrant big cities, like a, you know, another place in the Northeast would be Boston, um, and, uh, and you know, a, a lot less in Chicago, but a little bit in Chicago, I think the weather there um, is, is just too damaging. So, the, so a number of questions about homelessness. Uh, why is there such a big homeless problem? Um, why did it kind of show up in the 1980s, um, you know, as, as an issue, as a problem? Uh, and, um, uh, you know, what, what are the origins of it? So why wasn't the homelessness in significant numbers before that? Uh, what are kind of the numbers and, 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 and what's, where is it dominant? So it's interesting. I looked up the numbers and they were about again, official stats, I don't know how they do this. I don't know if this reflects reality. You can get non-official statistics that are significantly higher than this. So I don't know, I, I, I have no expertise in this area. I don't know uh, what to believe. We're gonna use official stats here because that's the best I have. And, and I think there's a lot of also scaremongering going on to try to beef up and, and make those stats look a lot worse. But official stats are somewhere around 580,000 homeless people in the United States. Um, that, is, that is up um, uh, over the last few years, but down from uh, 2007, where there were over 600,000 uh, homeless people. Uh, I saw one source that claimed there were like 2.5 million homeless people in 2008. I'm a little suspicious of that gap between 620, 630, and two point something million particularly when you think there's probably a political agenda uh, driving some of, those, uh, some of those numbers. So what happened in the 1980s that created the homeless problem? And uh, what can we learn from the causes in order to prescribe the solutions? Um, and again, while homeless numbers have probably not gone up that much, certainly not over the last decade, decade and a half. I think what has gone up is the concentration in a few places, like San Francisco, and the tolerance of them. That is the, the, the willingness of cities to let them basically take over big swaths of the city, particularly the downtowns. Um, so it's, it's more the policy towards them and their concentration. Uh, you, you don't find... Um, homeless people, let's say, in, in Mississippi, uh, even though Mississippi is the poorest state in the union, there are not a lot of homeless people in Mississippi, and we'll talk about why that is. Um, and, 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 and generally, places like Mississippi, Alabama, uh, states that, are, that have very high poverty rates don't have very high homeless rates. And you, 
partially this goes to the idea that homelessness is not fundamentally an issue of poverty. Poverty is uh, a, a necessary, but is not sufficient in order to create uh, homelessness. So what does create homelessness? And for this, I, you know, as always, when we dig deep into this kind of topics, it's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. And to really get a handle on it and to make, I think, this interesting and to really understand what's going on and understand the complexity and understand what the solutions need to look like, we have to do a little bit of history. And we have to go back in history and, and, and look at, at what's going on. And it, look, the, the, uh, but let's start with the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is a mismatch of supply and demand. In this case, the supply and demand for cheap housing, for low income housing, for housing that poor people can't afford. I, I was on a debate with uh, Econ Boy yesterday, and one of the claims that he made was, if you look at um, the amount of income that poor people have after they get government transfers, after they get uh, food stamps and vouchers and all the stuff that they get, there are very, very, very few people in the United States who are poor. I think he said 2.5% versus the official poverty number, which is 15%, but that is before transfer payments. Well, once you get transfer payments, there's almost nobody poor in the U.S. because they all get a significant amount of money from the government that puts them at above whatever the poverty level is. So, I don't get that, Wanda Freeman. I don't, I don't think that was true at all. But anyway, uh, Wanda Freeman was commenting on the debate yesterday. I, I think the opposite is true. Um, so, you know, the, 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 um, uh, if you look at poverty, um, people should have enough money to be able to pay rent. And yet, we have a massive mismatch because we don't have housing for people who are poor. And even poor people who do have housing today spend a disproportionate amount of their income on housing. Uh, and, and this is not just poor people, just generally. Uh, I read somewhere that over 6 million people in the United States uh, spend over 50% of their income, over 50% of their income on housing. That is on rent, or I guess mortgage, but primarily rent. That's absurd. Uh, and, and that lowers the standard of living, the quality of their life, the ability to consume other things, the ability to save. So uh, we have in this country a significant mismatch of between uh, people's income and housing that matches that income. We have a supply-demand problem, and the primary issue is supply. We just don't have supply of affordable housing, of low-income housing, of housing people can actually afford. So, uh, you know, in order to, to, if, to see that, in order to, uh, to try to understand the problems in the housing market, we actually need to go back to the Great Depression. And, uh, you know, the first thing uh, to, uh, that we realize when we go back to the uh, Great Depression is that there is no free market in housing. Housing is heavily, heavily, heavily dominated by government policy. Uh, we'll talk initially about federal government policy and then about state and, and local city government uh, policy. But there is no, you know, uh, uh, the market will adjust. There is no free market in housing. Uh, the left would love us to believe that that is the case. The right doesn't want to really challenge it because they don't want to get rid of the real problems, the, the real uh, uh, government intervention in housing. Uh, to a large extent, uh, the right is supportive of much of the... Uh, government policy with regard to housing. 
but uh, there is no free market. In the 1930s, a decision was made um, to support the construction and ultimately the, the, the purchase of housing by Americans. And a number of institutions were set up in order to facilitate that. You probably know of HUD, which guarantees mortgages, which provides mortgage insurance, uh, and therefore lowers the cost of mortgages. I'm sure you're familiar with Fannie Mae and Fannie, Freddie Mac. Fannie Mae was established uh, right after, uh, right during the, uh, you know, I think 1940, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, Freddie Mac was established in the 1960s in order to again support the mortgage market and to make financing a home um, easier and cheaper so that people could move into homes. And indeed, uh, home ownership in the United States grew from uh, somewhere in, I think, the, the, the early 40s, around 40-something percent to over 60 percent, and I think it peaked just before the financial crisis at 68 percent. Uh, it has now gone back down to what it was before the financial crisis, before uh, all the housing programs of, of Bill Clinton and George Bush, to about 63 percent. But, uh, but uh, you know, home ownership uh, is, uh, is in the 60s, which is a goal of government. It, it's, it's, a, it's the purpose of all these programs. You could add to that the fact that uh, the only interest that individuals can deduct off of their taxes um, is interest on a mortgage. So the government is telling you that uh, the one debt that they will reward you for, in a sense, uh, by allowing you to keep more of your money, um, is a mortgage. Uh, it's the only kind of debt that they value. It used to be that you could deduct uh, other kinds of debt, um, other kind of interest on debt. But uh, since, I think, 1986, a tax reform bill, uh, you can only deduct uh, your mortgage. So uh, the government is giving prefer preferential treatment to taking out a mortgage. Uh, you can't deduct your rent from taxes. But you can deduct the interest on the mortgage, which is equivalent to a rent. So the government has significantly provided preferential treatment for home purchases. And of course, who are the biggest beneficiaries of these home purchases and the biggest beneficiaries of the deduction of interest on a mortgage? Well, the biggest beneficiaries are the middle class and the wealthy. So many, and we'll see that basically all housing policy that creates homelessness is driven by, uh, driven by policies that are, that are uh, there to enhance uh, the uh, well-being of the middle class and the wealthy. Uh, you know, all done, uh, disguised by the idea that we're trying to take poor, care of the poor, and we, you know, uh, generally what the government does with a lot of these programs is it throws crumbs to the poor. But the real big government programs are always there uh, for the middle class. Uh, they're not primarily there uh, for the poor. Put on vote, and the, 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 the poor just are not top of mind of anybody. So what you had is, is all these government policies driving people to buy homes um, and, and, and making it cheaper and cheaper for people to buy homes are more and more incentivized, particularly, uh, particularly for, um, again, the middle class. On top of that, starting in the 1950s, with the uh, uh, you know, uh, building of the highway system, the United States uh, interstate highway system, there was a huge push to develop areas outside of the cities. Uh, in other words, develop suburbia. And of course, the highway system, to a large extent, the highway system made suburbia possible. It's not clear that we would have suburbs in the, in the, in the way in which they developed, if not for the interstate highway system. So uh, we had a highway system that basically made it easy to commute in and out of the cities, allow people to work on the outskirts, but also move jobs into the outskirts, moved a lot of the middle class, uh, higher paying jobs out into the outskirts and left in the in the cities, uh, primarily manufacturing jobs and the workers who worked in those manufacturing jobs. And part of the idea here and part of the reason 
why you didn't have homelessness uh, in the 50s, 60s, even in the 70s, is because as middle class people, uh, uh, wealthy people were leaving the inner city, they were selling their properties in the inner city, they were moving uh, to the suburbs, they were buying homes in the suburbs, uh, the prices of inner city properties dropped precipitously, and poor people could afford to buy those places. Um, uh, maybe they couldn't buy them, they could rent them. Uh, maybe landlords could buy them up and rent them uh, to low income. Maybe landlords could buy them up and turn them into, um, you know, these kind of uh, uh, rooms that, that poor people would rent, that, that particularly single men would rent and, and, and pay daily, uh, which got them off the street and, and provided them with a place to live. So for a long period of time, the inner cities, while not very pleasant for many of us to go to, uh, not pleasant certainly for us to live in, the inner cities were places in which uh, people living on low wages could live. They were filled with crime, and again, they, they weren't particularly pleasant, but they provided a roof, they provided community, they provided a home for people. And at all different levels, there were some uh, fairly nice, uh, fairly large homes that uh, middle class and again up, upper income people had, had left and sold for very uh, cheap to go to the suburbs that now could be turned into uh, nice homes uh, for families, uh, low income families. But then uh, there were also uh, these like kind of hotel flop houses, whatever you want to call them, where, where people could go and just rent a room for a while as they, uh, as they got themselves on their feet. So, uh, you know, there were a lot of different options. And housing was cheap. Uh, the government did build some uh, low-income housing starting in the 30s. So starting in the 30s, there was such a thing as public housing. And they did build, if you remember, in New York and Chicago and a lot of our cities, they, they were these massive communist-looking, uh, 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 you know, apartment buildings with tiny little apartments, uh, ugly, massive, huge buildings. You can still see a little bit of that in kind of the east side of New York, uh, lower east side of Manhattan. Uh, but, uh, but a lot of those buildings, we'll talk about it, have gone. But uh, massive complexes of public housing uh, were built. And again, uh, were, were very affordable. And people could live there. So you had government-owned public housing, but you had private housing that was cheap. It was very cheap all over the inner cities. Um, and this was really the situation. Uh, so even when, um, you know, people talk a lot about the reform to the mental health system that took a lot of mental health people out and they left the institutions and, and into, the, into the streets. Well, it turned out that those really started in the 60s and 70s. And yet there was very little homelessness in the 60s and 70s. Homelessness is really a phenomena of uh, the 80s. And, and, and the real question is, what happened? What happened? Uh, you know, one of the things that happened in the 50s, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, particularly after the World War, but all through uh, the creation of the suburbs, is that the United States produced more housing units, more new housing units than new household formation. So there was a boom in building. There was massive quantities of houses being constructed. Supply matched demand. And this trickle-down effect, where the middle class and the, and, and the wealthy moved out of the cities, created large supplies of housing for lower-income people in the heart of the cities. Um, so that's the situation going into the 1980s. Overall, a situation where um, there's plenty of supply. Uh, people, you know, the middle class and the, and, and the wealthy in the suburbs, the poor in the center cities, but, but they have homes. So there is no real issue of, um, uh, you know, homelessness. But what happens in the late 1970s, early 1980s? People start, uh, middle class people, uh, uh, start moving back into 
the cities. Uh, you start getting a phenomena of uh, the, the U.S. economy shifting, shifting towards service jobs, service jobs that tend to be in the center cities. A lot of cities decide to knock down their public housing uh, complexes uh, in order to build office buildings, in order to build fancier condominium buildings, partially because these uh, massive public housing buildings are riddled with crime and drugs and all kinds of other problems. And the easiest way is to just get rid of them, rather than solve problems, just get rid of the houses. And they knock down uh, these buildings. You know, good riddance, they were ugly and horrible, uh, but they create a problem. Where do these people go? Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, so you're knocking down these buildings, you're building new skyscrapers inside the city centers. Uh, you, uh, you know, now people have an incentive, particularly young people, to move back into the center city. So neighborhoods are being gentrified. And the thing about gentrification is they're not being gentrified um, because as a market phenomenon, a lot of the gentrification is subsidized by government. So uh, uh, people are getting and developers are getting all kinds of tax credits and all kinds of uh, tax breaks and all kinds of subsidies to go into the cities and start buying up some of these uh, uh, falling apart uh, uh, buildings and, and turn them into nice buildings that now raise the cost. Poor people again are kicked out. Where do they go? At about the same time, building codes start shifting. So cities like New York, cities like San, well, San Francisco, we'll get to. San Francisco is unique, but it's even worse. But building codes across the country start shifting. Whereas it's, in a sense, I illegal to build low-income housing. Houses have, ha have to have so many bathrooms per bedrooms. They can't be smaller than a certain size of a, uh, you know, a certain size, a certain square foot. Um, you know, buildings have to be, apartments have to be of high building quality, uh, uh, you know, again, of high, um, uh, to, to adapt, to uh, accommodate a, a relatively high standard of living and quality of life, not really suited for poor people, for people who don't have a lot of money. So uh, what happens is that the cost of building goes up. The cost of building goes up not because materials have gone up, not because contractors are making more money, but because the code, the building codes, as written by the regulators, as written by cities and counties, now raise the cost of building the building. So the cost of the apartments is now more expensive. And all those people who were kicked out of the public housing all those people who are being gentrified out of their neighborhoods, and, and while the owners of those buildings might make money, because as, as uh, the gentrification is, is, is coming, house prices are going up, and, and some people are benefiting from that, but those are the owners, but the residents who are paying rent are not benefiting from it. They're being kicked out. There's no alternative housing for them, because the cost of housing at the lowest end is higher than what it used to be much higher than what it used to be. Not because the market can't supply low-income housing, but because government won't allow people to build low-income housing. Again, all the standards by which housing need to be built have been raised dramatically. So housing becomes more and more and more expensive, particularly in the cities particularly in cities that are gentrifying, particularly in cities that have robust building codes, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Of course, one of the reasons you don't get homelessness in Mississippi is because the cost of housing is low, because they can still afford the homes there, because, uh, you know, even if the center of the city might be gentrifying, you can live outside of the city. You can live in trailer parks. You can live in all kinds of different places where the cost of housing is still really, really, really cheap. But you can't do that in Boston, which is, you know, demolishing whole neighborhoods and building skyscrapers, primarily offices, destroying apartments, and then 
really high priced condos and there's just no building going on that is low income building. It just doesn't exist. And then of course you get a city like San Francisco that won't allow building high, won't allow tall buildings and won't literally won't allow low income buildings for the reasons I said before. And of course, what does that do? That raises the value of the homes of people in San Francisco. It raises the value of the homes in people in LA. It raises the value of the homes in people in New York. It raises the value of the home of the people who are gentrifying. And again, it makes it, it, it provides massive rewards to uh, the middle class and to the wealthy who are benefiting from rising home prices. They make sure to vote to make sure that the um, housing codes don't change, that the housing codes are so stringent that only expensive houses can be built so that their house constantly goes up in value. So, uh, you know, this mechanism uh, continues and continues and continues. And, and some of what has happened is that you do get some uh, low-income housing at the periphery of the cities. You see this in some parts of Chicago, outside of downtown. Downtown's way too expensive for, for any, any, anybody in poverty. But even there, housing is still expensive because of building codes and, and everything else. And there's not enough of it. Because one of the things that's happened over the last 40 years, since 1980, is that we don't build enough. We don't build enough by far. There is a massive shortage of housing units in the United States. And of course, again, some people benefit from that. People already own their home because that's what drives prices up. It's shortages. And the shortage is there because land is not being freed up by zoning committees. The shortage is there because of immigration constraints that don't allow bringing in enough construction workers. We just have a shortage in construction workers in the US and particularly when you clamp down on illegal immigration, building homes becomes much more difficult. You just don't have the labor. And it's not even a price. You can't find the labor. I mean, look at the labor shortage that exists in the United States today. The, 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 what, the 10 million open positions, 11 million open positions that can be filled, many of those in the construction industry. And they could be filled if we allowed for immigration, but we don't. So, uh, Michael says, I don't see many homeless people in big cities like Florida, Miami, and West Palm Beach. That's right, because some places are very good at exporting their homeless people elsewhere. But it's just as true, that the, 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 if you look at the actual numbers, uh, Florida has a high level of homelessness for exactly the reasons I've described. Florida has become, in many parts of it, too expensive for people to live in. And they export their homelessness out because they're tough on the homeless. So yes, you can adopt a tough on homeless strategy, which I think you should, um, to clear out the pavements, to clear out the encampments, to move them out, and they just move somewhere else. Uh, Florida, in particular, has, has done that effectively, but Florida has a large number of homeless. I, I haven't looked deeply into which parts of Florida, where they, where they camp out, but they exist, they're there. You know, California, I think, has the most homeless. California and York, by far, have the most. Um, but basically, every, but so does, but Texas has, and so does Florida. You don't see homeless people in Dallas, but you see them in Austin, because they think Dallas exports them to Austin. Dallas is tough on them, Austin is not, so they all go to Austin. But you still have significant numbers of homelessness in Texas. You have them anywhere where you have a thriving, gentrifying city. Uh, Austin has particularly uh, gentrified. Now, I'm not against gentrification. I'm against government subsidizing gentrification. I'm against the building codes that make it impossible to build low-income housing. I'm against the government subsidizing the housing for the middle class by providing them with insurance and their mortgage, by providing them with repackaged mortgages through Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, and by providing an interest deduction on mortgages. 
I'd like to see everybody's taxes cut and all deductions taken away. Uh, uh, Tazy mentions Giuliani. I mean, Giuliani, uh, basically what happened in New York, but this is true in San Francisco, this is true in LA, this is certainly in LA, this is true in uh, Boston, is there were all sections of New York uh, which had uh, poor people living in them. Not just Harlem, but even part of what today is Midtown. Uh, there were what are called flop houses. There were these day uh, uh, short-term hotels. Um, there were very unpleasant areas uh, in New York uh, to, to live by. And basically what these cities did is they made those things illegal. They, they demolished them. They destroyed them. Um, famously, and, and I was reading, I read this in an article written in 1989, so this is not a, uh, this has nothing to do with Trump of, of, as president. But um, the Trump Tower, uh, the Trump Tower that was built, I think, on Madison Avenue, um, used to be uh, this kind of, um, the whole block was, was kind of seedy and, um, and an area where, uh, uh, you know, poor people lived and uh, uh, a lot of kind of one bedroom uh, or one room ap uh, apartments and rented and, and they basically knocked it down and built a Trump Tower and Trump got a huge city from Giuliani, a huge subsidy to build that tower as the developers all over the place. So yes, New York was cleaned up, but it's cleaned up by fascist methods. It was cleaned up by making it illegal, uh, by, by taking property away from people, making it illegal for certain businesses and certain uh, types of homes uh, to be built by uh, what's called abatement, uh, you know, and, and by changing city zoning rules. It started before Giuliani. It, it started in the 19, in late 1970s. Um, and, and yeah, New York is clean. Fascists do a very good job at cleaning up a city. No question about that. But what you get is homelessness. What you get are, are people who used to live in homes, used to be able to afford to live in homes, and now cannot. And, uh, you know, for a while, I think New York did a good job pushing the homeless problem outside of the city. In more recent time, the homeless problem has come back into the city, you know, but it is New York that's created a huge part of the homeless problem. A huge part of the homeless problem. You know, government subsidies is not, is not a market. I, you know, I don't, I don't support subsidies for business. I don't support subsidies for builders. I don't support subsidies for cleaning up a city. I don't support subsidies for Trump. I don't support subsidies for anybody. Um, and I don't support evicting people because the mayor doesn't like the business you're in. I don't support evicting people because he doesn't like the amount of money you make. I don't support changing the rules because you want to clean it up. It's fascism. And yeah, I get it that, that fascism works in narrow sense, but there are prices to pay. And yes, it's true, we all get to enjoy clean, nice, friendly New York, and we don't care and we don't look at the, the evils uh, that happen elsewhere. All right, so uh, this is where homelessness came from. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbrookshow.com support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one of those uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content, and of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.